Okay, hello everyone. My name is Shakela Alvarenga, and thank you for being here for tonight, for tonight's program, Mystery Solved, How Tech Changed the Game for Cold Case Detectives. So tonight we will be delving into the very captivating world of cold case homicide investigations and explore how the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has used technology to crack cases that have remained unsolved for 40 plus years, generating fresh leads for investigators to pursue. Allow me to introduce our speakers for this evening's event. Sitting next to me is investigator Terry Miller. She was hired in 1996 by the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and retired in 2017 after achieving her long-term goal of becoming a homicide detective. In 2018, she was asked to return to Metro to work on the homicide cold case team where she currently is using the newest forensic technology to bring Metro's oldest cases to a modern forensic standard. Joining her is investigator Dan Long, who retired from Metro's ho Metro Homicide in 2016, also returned in 2018 to lend his expertise to the cold case unit. During his time in homicide, Long personally investigated 219 homicides and assisted in the investigation of more than 900 homicide investigations. Leading the LVMPD Homicide Cold Case Unit is Sergeant Matt Downing, who was promoted to sergeant in 2018 and worked in patrol, plainclothes operations, and missing persons before being assigned to the homicide section as the cold case supervisor. And throughout the program, we will also hear from Mr. Justin Wu, the co-founder of the Vegas Justice League, an organization committed to providing closure to local families and solving cold cases throughout the use of cutting edge DNA technology. Please give our panelists a round of applause. So let us begin with investigator Terry Miller and her team who will give an overview about Metro's relatively new venture into genealogy and discuss the significance of FGG, stands for familial gen genetic genealogy as an emerging standard investigative tool. And just so you all can kind of know the lay down of the program, we're going to do this overview for about a half an hour and then we will get into a Q&A between all of the panelists. Thank you, Shakela. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, hopefully you'll find this interesting. Um, but at this point, these type of uh, investigations seem to be heading in the same direction as uh, DNA did when uh, Las Vegas Metro Police Department started using it in the late 1990s. Other states are also using FGG technology as well. You may be familiar with Florida, who in particular has had some very good successes with genealogy cases to include the su successful prosecution of the cases. Most of us also know the success California had in uh, the last five to six years when the Golden State Killer was identified using FGG in 2018. But I can tell you this, no two cases have been the same for us yet. This is Stephanie Isaacson. She, in 1989, was just 14 years of age. She left her school at approximately 6.30 in the morning, and she walked a path that took, um, took her through an open field. It was a shortcut to the high school that she attended. Unfortunately, um, her parents later learned that Stephanie never made it to school that day. Around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, they filed a missing persons um, report after they started making phone calls trying to find their daughter, and no one had seen her all day. An all-out search... Uh, at that point started with ground units, air units, canine, volunteers, anybody they could get to help with the case, uh, trying to locate her. At approximately 2,200 hours or 10 p.m., Stephanie's body was located hidden beneath the trash and brush in a field, that same field where the kids took the shortcut from. She was nude, and there had been uh, evidence of sexual assault and a struggle. Her book bag was found, um, laying in the bushes, and that's where they zeroed in on and, was, and were able to find her body. There were approximately, throughout the years, 27 possible suspects identified in this case, um, and, <clears throat> and that was over the last 32 years. The detectives looked at sex offenders, potential boyfriends, transients that were living in the area. Um, we 
tried to be very open-minded in getting this case solved. Numerous buckle swabs were obtained throughout the years, but no hits were ever received in CODIS. We would receive uh, phone calls from Stephanie's parents periodically throughout these years, and not just myself and, and Dan, but um, all the other detectives that originally started with this case 32 years ago. And they wanted to see if anything had, uh, had developed. And though um, they were separated at the time of her divorce, both parents still continued to call throughout the years. And mom at times was very emotional when she did call. Um, and she would tell us that even though she appreciated the ongoing efforts that, that not only Dan and I were doing, or the team, uh, but also Metro as a whole, but she said she just knew that this case was never gonna be solved, at least while she was still alive. In November of 2020, homicide cold case was notified by our DNA forensic lab that there was a generous donor who wanted to pay for, for new testing for a cold case homicide. It was going to be a blind donation with the donor not knowing about the case, nor Dan or I or the team knowing about the donor. And we chose Stephanie's case. Detectives were notified by the LVMPD DNA lab that we had a very minute amount of DNA left and the testing would consume the sample, which means that there would be nothing left for us after this. Working hand in hand with the LVMPD DNA lab, detectives decided it was worth the risk and we decided we would submit the last of the DNA sample for the FGG testing. In January of 2021, our 120 picograms of remaining suspect DNA was sent to Othram Incorporated for genome sequencing and genealogical research. There's more DNA in a fingerprint than what we had to send. In July of 2021, Metro was notified that there was a new lead and DNA confirmation was needed. The lead provided by Othram Incorporated was Darren Roy Marchin or someone very close to him. Records checks were conducted on Marchin, and detectives learned that Marchin's DNA <clears throat> was already in our evidence vault from a previous sexual assault from 1986. A drug comparison was done against Marchin's DNA, and the DNA recovered at the scene of the murder. The DNA lab manager called and advised of a positive match just days later. Othram Incorporated confirmed they were able to make this identification with the smallest amount of DNA yet, less than 15 human cells. And with the identification of March and another case can be solved now. Nanette Vanderberg was 24, and she had been found deceased in her apartment, bathtub, sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Marchin admitted in 1986 that he had recently began dating Vanderberg, and he'd been out on a date with her the evening prior to her death. Detectives have already looked at him very closely during that time. But during his preliminary hearing, case was dismissed due to insufficient evidence to bind him over in district court. Dis detectives had recovered Marchin's prints in the crime scene, but his attorney argued that those prints were there because he had been in the apartment within 24 hours of her death and he was released. Darren Marchin. Notification of Marchin's family was made at this point. <clears throat> and we located them here, and initially, of course, they didn't want to talk to us but we were able to finally find uh, some information out from family members who were willing to talk eventually. And they told us that he had a long history of drug abuse and that he'd hung himself in 1995 and left behind a wife and three kids. And during this discussion with the family, of course, they were reeling from the news that he had committed two murders. And one thing we have talked about as a unit not only is it important for us to um, tell family members of the victims, but it's also important for us to let the suspect's family know what's going on. A lot of times, as in these two cases, his family had no idea that this had happened and that he was a suspect in these cases. And when it hits the news, you can imagine how you would feel if it was someone you knew or that was close to you, and it's, um, it's important to give them a heads up you know, so that they're not taken by surprise. Today, no other cases have hit in CODIS with, uh, or during a direct comparison of the forensic DNA evidence in any of Metro's other cold cases with Marchin as a suspect. Kim Bryant. Kim Bryant was 16-year-old high school student who attended 
Western High School. She left school around 9.50 in the morning on January 26, 1979. She walked to the Dairy Queen nearby with a girlfriend and used a payphone to call her boyfriend to pick her up. Her friend called her own mother, who arrived around 10.15 and offered Kim a ride home also. But Kim declined, stating that she'd already reached out to her boyfriend and was com he was coming to pick her up. At approximately 10.35 hours, Kim's boyfriend arrived at the Dairy Queen, but he couldn't locate her. So he called home to see if, um, if she had called and canceled the ride and learned that she had not called. And he looked around, couldn't find her, and said that he left the area. Almost a month later, on February 20th, 1979, juveniles playing in the desert area located what they believed was a dead body. And the body was partially covered with debris and trash. It appeared to be a female. She was nude from the waist down. Metro detectives responded and the remains of Kim Bryant were recovered. The autopsy revealed Kim had been sexually assaulted and suffered blunt force trauma to the head. In 2018, <laughs> Metro Cold Case receives from two different individuals some information on this case. One was a fellow Metro officer who stated that his great-grandmother gave a dying declaration that one of her sons was possibly involved in Kim's murder. And in the same week, we get another call from a male in Utah who has a very similar story to what our Metro officer told us. The male out of Utah advised his brother may be involved in the murder. So Dan and I traveled up to Utah and spoke with both the brother and the sister who offered detectives their DNA and provided a recorded statement to us. They talked about their mother having located Kim's purse along US 95, where she was believed to have been kidnapped from. Their mother had initially lied to police about where she had located the purse because she wanted to protect her other son. The purse was actually recovered from their brother's bedroom by their mother, they said. And a search of the case file later confirmed that their mother had contacted detectives and brought the purse into Metro headquarters. Utah detectives assisted Metro in getting buckle swab warrant domesticated for the DNA. And detectives conducted a voluntary recorded statement with that possible suspect. And guess what? He admitted he found a purse at the Dairy Queen. And he stated he was on a bicycle that day at the Dairy Queen, but he would not commit to us that he had been in a car. He also denied that he knew who Kim Bryant was, even though they were about the same age. He admitted he told his mother about the purse, which he had given to his mother, but he denied that he ever went through the purse. He could not explain why he took the purse he allegedly found in the parking lot of the Dairy Queen, but admitted he understood why Metro detectives thought that he was involved, and voluntarily complied and gave Dan and I his DNA via buckle swab. Detectives us, returned to Vegas, and I was confident that we were going to get our hit on this case. But a short time later, the forensic report revealed it was not a match, which was devastating to this investigation for us. And detectives could not believe a viable person who had been identified, who admitted he remembered Kim's case, who admitted he was at our scene, who admitted to taking Kim's purse home, who lived less than a mile from the uh, crime scene of the kidnapping, and whose own mother inserted herself into the investigation, was not going to be our suspect. There was no DNA match in CODIS, so after all this time, a decision was made. On August 20, 21, DNA recovered from Ken's autopsy was sent to Otham Incorporated. And in October of 21, 21 Outhram Incorporated advised they had developed a lead, and that lead was Johnny Blake Peterson or someone very close to him. Records checks were conducted, and detectives learned Johnny Blake Peterson had committed suicide on January 20th, 1993 in Las Vegas. Peterson had been arrested by Metro in April of 1980 for a sexual assault. The case had been dismissed prior to trial. Further records checks revealed Johnny Blake Peterson's father was still alive and allegedly living in Oregon. And detectives contacted the Josephine uh, Sheriff's Department to request assistance in domesticating a warrant for the Peterson's father's DNA via buckle swab. But when Josephine County detectives made contact in Oregon, they learned that the father had moved. And they also learned that Peterson had three children who were living somewhere in New York State. So we had a conference with 
Othram Incorporated, and a decision was made that we would obtain the DNA of one of Peterson's children. So the hunt was on for Peterson's grown children somewhere on the East Coast in New York. But detectives located Peterson's brother living in the Las Vegas area, and you can imagine he was stunned when he was told the story. And then he told detectives that he had actually been in Peterson's truck when he was arrested for that sexual assault in 1983. But then he gave us bad news because then he told us he was not the biological brother of Peterson. It's never easy. No. <laughs> However, he did know where father, Peterson's father was living and he was here in the Las Vegas area. So in November of 2021, detectives obtained the DNA of Peterson's father and sent the sample to Othram Incorporated for te its kin snip testing. And a short time later, detectives were advised by Othram Incorporated there was a positive identi identification based on the DNA from the scene. Johnny Blake Peterson was the person who kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and killed Kim by blunt force trauma to the head. Johnny Blake Peterson. In December of 2021, we weren't done. We contacted the family in New York. We found them through the help with our law enforcement partners back there. And we were able to speak with Peterson's widow. And boy, did she have an interesting story to tell us. While she was pregnant with their first son in November, December of 1983, she discovered a pair of women's panties in the truck they owned. And she said she confronted Peterson, who told her it was just his brothers who were trying to get him in trouble. And a short time later, she said she noticed that Peterson had new headphones. And when she confronted him on where he'd gotten the headphones, he told her that he'd just found them. So remember back in that time, 1983, headphones were a big deal. She said a short time later, the, the headphones were gone. So she asked him again, and this time he tells her, oh, I lost them. She told detectives that she was young, naive, and pregnant at the time of the incident, but she'd always been bothered by this because she felt that he was lying. Diana Hansen. Diana was 24 years old. She had been home to Las Vegas for the holiday se season, and she was visiting with her family and friends. And she had been attending college in Texas. She had a boyfriend, and her life was going very well for her. On December 30th, 1983, Diana's father returned home from working a graveyard shift here in Las Vegas, chatted with his daughter, he said, and then he went to bed. He woke up around 5.30 that evening. Diana wasn't home, and so he assumed that she'd gone out for a run, as was her habit. Diana did not come home all evening, which caused the parents to start to worry. They couldn't locate her. So on December 31st, 1983, a missing person's report was filed with Metro. And at 9.56 a.m., less than two hours after that missing person's report was filed, the body of a young female was located in the desert area. She was nude from the waist down and appeared to have been stabbed multiple times. The scene, there's a fence here in this photo, and so our scene is drawn out because... Diana had been sexually assaulted and stabbed multiple times in the chest and abdomen. Her clothing were strewn along the area. She had attempted to run from her attacker while fighting him off. Multiple witnesses contacted police to report what they had observed. There was an all-out media push on this case. A female jogger had been seen on December 30th, 1983 by lots of people. They reported where they had seen her. Multiple tips came in regarding a vehicle that was possibly involved, but no suspect was ever identified. Also, we learned that Diana's headphones were missing. December 2021, 38 years later, after multiple calls with Johnny Blake Peterson, Peterson's family members, did Metro detectives finally get the lead that they've been waiting for? Was this a coincidence? Detectives continued to pu push forward and we continue to discuss the facts of this case and what we learned from Peterson's family on the East Coast with the DNA lab. And the DNA lab agreed to conduct the direct comparison with the DNA recovered from Diana Hansen 
to Peterson's DNA. December 2021, detectives received notification that there was a positive confirmation. Johnny Blake Peterson was the person who kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and stabbed Diana to death. So you can see, we, only, we not only use technology in a variety of different technology, it also takes a lot of effort by our team to reach out and have conversations with um, our community, with our other law enforcement partners. We, we rely on our partners in other states a lot, uh, especially because Las Vegas is such a transient area. Um, so we have people in and out all the time. And also um, with just good old police work uh, to get these cases solved. Thank you, Terry. Um, that was very helpful. I think it would be good to just start with the cold case unit in general. Um, I know over the past few years, there has been a push to hire more detectives like yourself who you know, may have retired but are not ready to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of tell me a little bit about uh, the cold case unit. Uh, well, initially they started with uh, uh, cold case. They were using detectives from other units. And I know Henderson's back there, so I don't want to insult anybody. Um, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't quite understand homicides. Working, I worked 17 years as a homicide detective. Terry worked as my partner for some of those years. Um, they started deciding to pull in homicide detectives to work these cold cases because you're, you don't have a crime scene. You're not going to have the crime scene to go to. So you're pulling cases and you're reading officers' reports on what they did and how they did it, looking at photographs. And obviously, when we're deciding what homicides to look at in cold case, we're going to cherry pick to begin with. So we're looking for the rape murders. We're looking for stabbings because you're up close and personal. Physical contact is what we're looking for because DNA is, is the tool of choice right now. Um, and we have a benefactor that's given us money to get into the DNA because it's expensive work. Uh, so that's what we look for. And then literally what we're doing is we're starting from where they left off and just picking it back up again. And uh, it's been working. It's been working for us pretty well. Uh, Terry has done just a couple and she, she briefly covered those because there was a lot more to it. Uh, those cases were very involved. And Terry's very good at making contact and making relationships with people. And it, it really, really helps us. Uh, in those cases, uh, we have quite a few that have been solved. But again, what, what are they called? We're taking the low-hanging fruit because we can pick whatever we want. There were 1,169 cold cases when I came into homicide in uh, 2018. And we've had so many retire and leave uh, police work that it's it's the number is quite higher than that now so we are again we're, we're cherry picking our way through these specifically looking for DNA not looking for more leads that a detective may have missed it's 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 just that another tool has become available to us you have anything to add to that yeah as Dan said um, the the DNA work on these cases is very very expensive the forensic work that needs to be done is is time consuming and manpower intensive as well. So we wanna get kinda, of, we wanna utilize our resources uh, the best that we can. So we wanna take those cases that we think just at least on their face from reading it, uh, we look at the evidence that we still have available uh, in our evidence vault, um, what can be tested, what hasn't been tested, and we wanna choose those cases that are gonna give us the best results uh, with the least amount of resources that we have to expend at this point. We, we have a lot of cases to go through, and eventually we're going to work our way through those cases, and as time goes on, technology will get better. Uh, but right now, we're gonna, we try to use our resources as best as we can to solve as many cases with the limited resources that we have. Justin Wu, where does the Vegas Justice League fit into all of this? 
So this started in 2020 with the first case, which was Stephanie Isaacson. And I had talked to Othram, and they've been doing amazing things around the country with DNA solving cases. And um, since I moved to Vegas in 2015, I made him a deal. I said, hey, if you have a case that's in the Las Vegas area, I'll sponsor that one for you. And that ended up solving the Stephanie Isaacson and uh, Nanette Vandenberg cases. So after that, um, I kind of you know, put my creative hat on and said, like, hey, let me get some more people in the community, friends and, uh, and business people that I know together. We'll uh, create what's called the Justice League. Each person, a member of the Justice League donates the $5,000, which is the amount that's required to uh, reevaluate the DNA for one case. So it's been, a, it's been a great pilot program so far that we've seen that we've been able to help out um, you know, local law enforcement. We've also um, been doing some cases with uh, the coroner's office, Henderson PD, North Las Vegas PD. So we really want to try to, in the future, help them get through the cold case log. And then as we do that, get to the newer cases where we're potentially taking serial killers off the streets um, today. And kind of to add, because of the successes that we've had uh, with your generosity and the ability to solve some of those cases, uh, Metro specifically has uh, kind of dedicated additional resources to that where we hadn't had a dedicated cold case team uh, prior to January of last year. It was really just uh, five part-time former homicide investigators who came back and worked part-time during the week. Uh, Metro actually dedicated resources with myself as a full-time supervisor, and we now have three full-time detectives in addition to our part, uh, five part-time investigators that are able to put those resources and kind of help expedite solving some of those cases and looking at those cases and triaging those cases. Don't worry, we're getting those full-time detectives trained up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A question for all of you. What is that one case that is just, that sticks in the, the back of your mind? Well, Stephanie Isaacson was my project. Mm -hmm. I worked that, I, <laughs> when I said I thought we had that, when we came back from Utah, I, I was so happy on our drive back. I was like, we got it. We got it. We finally got it. And then, uh, devastated isn't really even the word. I was just like, oh, the air just left me. Uh, I was heartbroken that we didn't have it. But I'm glad, too, because we didn't arrest the wrong person. You know, it's just as important that we, it's important we get the right person and not make a quick arrest. And here's another thing I learned right off the bat. You cannot make assumptions. I mean, Kim, look at Kim Bryant. I mean, he's in the scene. He he took the purse. I, I, it was just crazy. And it, it wasn't him. So, um, but Stephanie Isaacson was one that uh, was, I was elated when we got that. I don't know about. Uh, mine is not adjudicated yet. It's not gone through trial. So I don't have a conviction. But I worked a case back in 2005 on a rape murder of a, a girl by the name of Sheila Quarles, who was 18 years old. And uh, I was going through a case from 2004 and I, I was look, just looking at the photos and reading the officer's report, like we do, and I recognized the MO, and it's the same man. And uh, we have the DNA confirmation. He is indicted, but we're waiting to go to trial. Mm. That's mine. And there's four of those. He's got four of them. Wow. And I, I got to meet Stephanie Isaacson's parents at a, I think it was a city council meeting where they gave me a proclamation. And they'd said like, you know, thank you so much. We've been crying every day for 30 something years. And, you know, thank you for bringing us closure. So for me, being able to give back to the family and help to provide closures for the families in Las Vegas was extremely important. Yeah. To everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Justin, I, I would like for you to talk a little bit more about the, the Justice League and, um, it's kind of fascinating to think of the power of the community. You know, it, you don't really know or, or think that you can get involved in, in this way and as impactful as the Justice League has been, but how has that been for you and, and you know, some of your team members as well? So, you know, when I first moved to Vegas in 2015, Vegas is a greatly philanthropical city. I went to like a lot of different galas, people that are raising millions of dollars for different causes. And you know, when I saw this thing, what we could do you know, with, with these cases, $5,000 was kind of a small amount for these people to come 
you know, step forward to be able to help their community. And, the, you know, the one thing that I wanted to do with, like, the, the concept of the Justice League was that as a team of people, and everybody puts up the money for one case, no person really, they're not assigned to a specific case, really. So, like, nobody really has, like, a loss, or, you know, there's a potential that we couldn't find the killer for one of these. So kind of like the team takes all the wins together and then no individual person ever really, you know, doesn't get, you know, it doesn't participate, I guess, in the wins with, with Metro and... Yeah. What would you say are some of the challenges that, that, I'm sure there are many, but, you know, some of the challenges <laughs> that you have had with trying to investigate these cases that go back decades? The, the biggest one is we don't live it. Detectives are called out at two o'clock in the morning because that's when everybody gets killed. And we go, st <laughs> we go stand over uh, the body, we work the scene, we talk to the witnesses, we go to the autopsy, and you live it. We're coming into a case and literally we're, we're looking at a log and okay, let's, let's find a good one here and like a rape murder and there's gonna be DNA. There's gotta be DNA and we work it from there. So you're not living the case. So you're reading the officer's reports, you're reading the statements from witnesses, you're looking at photographs of the autopsy, you're looking at photographs of the crime scene, but it's not the same. So, but you do need to just um, sink yourself into it and put yourself there. And it is challenging. Uh, and it, it, you, you find that key and that she was bludgeoned to death with a rock Let's get the rock, it's in evidence. Let's get the rock and test it and get the DNA off the rock. And then the crime lab is not very happy with us. Um, you know, it's a rock, but you know, it, it has worked in the past or you get a gun and if you fire a gun, it's in your hand, you're gonna have touch DNA on the, the handle of the gun, right? So, and we drive them crazy because we wanna test everything and it's expensive work, so. I think one of the the hardest things that I find is in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and most of 1990, um, DNA wasn't even thought about then. They didn't even know what DNA was. So when we go back to these 70s, 80s, and early 90s cases, it's a crapshoot whether or not the DNA is going to be degraded and whether we got the item that's going to give us the touch DNA that we can now get. Because, you know, back then, they, they were doing the latest and greatest technology then, and, um, and it's, we're just lucky if we can get it this, this many years later in 2023. But we do get surprised. The lab, the lab is very good at what they do, and they do and we're long shots, and we're like, here, can you try this? And they'll, they'll hit it for us. So we're, we're very happy. I didn't want to make it sound like I wasn't happy. <laughs> Just please, please, please do my next case. Our lab manager's in the back of it. <laughs> and she's fabulous to work with. Yes, I don't is. know if, if we got that across enough. You, you would all be surprised how closely um, our cold case unit works with our um, DNA lab people. That unit is, is, they're so smart and they're brilliant and uh, they work so hard. They sit down with us on a, on a regular basis and go through the crime scene photos with us, make suggestions, give us ideas on maybe go look at this, look at that, um, because they're seeing it from different eyes than what we are, you know, and um, it just, it's a really good partnership with our lab. Yeah. For people who don't know what Othram is. Can you can you talk a little bit more about about so, it? So Authram is a lab that's based in Houston, Texas. It's purpose built for um, reevaluating the DNA. So they have a million dollar machine that sequences the DNA that's provided by um, different law enforcement agencies around the country. And then they have a genealogical department, I guess, uh, which does the analysis of the DNA and like looks for you know somebody's great grandfather, somebody's great uncle, uh, co third cousin. Um, to provide the leads back to um, Metro or any other law enforcement agency. And, and that in itself actually provides its own challenge too because when we get uh, that report from Othram and, and it says, hey, you know, we've got uh, potential familial matches to a third cousin and they're building this tree, uh, this genealogical tree, 
Um, that's the third cousin of our potential suspect, but there's all of these other family members in between that both they're trying to search out by building that tree, but also that we have to go out and we have to potentially start testing those family members, getting their DNA, submitting that DNA to just help starting to narrow uh, it down to whoever that actual person is. So as good as that technology is and it's getting better day by day, uh, it's still a lot of weight legwork for us because we still have to go out and kind of fill in those blanks. Uh, it requires, you know, hours and travel and, uh, you know, getting DNA and the lab processing the DNA to kind of narrow that down and, and really hone in on a suspect. But then there's another component of it too that's like super interesting is the role of social media that they find that lead of somebody's, you know, grandfather and then they can look down the family tree, see the people and then, then be able to search back and say like this person had three brothers and one of them happened to live in Las Vegas during that time. So all of these tools are used by investigators and, you know, to, to solve these crimes. And Othram is relatively new, right? Um, yeah, I believe it's the three, four years old, I think, in the max, so. Wow. Um, you know, and before, the first time that they probably came to you, you, you guys were like, who are you and what are you guys talking yeah, about? And that's you know, yes, now, it was. now across the country, <laughs> when you talk about this, the police actually listen, because we have you know, stories from the New York Times to you know, the BBC about what we've done and this track record, and you know, Othram has solved cases around the country and you know, starting to do things around the world, so it's um, you know, a great movement that they're helping to create with law enforcement. Yeah. And then we get a lead and we have to go out to the family and get a DNA sample. And you all know that you love to sit down with a homicide detective and be interviewed. <laughs> they, it's so much fun. What was your reaction when, to, to Othram? Because this was you know, three, four, four years ago. Right. And, yeah. Uh, when um, our lab manager called and said, um, they want you to pick a case. Uh, and I was like, what, what, what are we doing? And, <laughs> and uh, so she was telling me it was cutting edge technology with the genome sequencing. And our lab looks at STRs, and, and we look at, you know, 20 to 25 um, on your DNA chain. The Othram lab looks at hundreds of thousands of them, and they call them SNPs. And they have that big, very expensive machine, and it can do the work so fast, and, and, it, looks at, and it looks at so many... Uh, markers on the DNA chain that um, it can get us pretty close in a very short period of time uh, because of that. So um, when they were explaining it to me, I'm by no means an expert in it, but um, I was like, well, this sounds pretty cool. And then we did it again, and we did it again, and we did it again, and it's been, it's wonderful. I can't say anything bad about them. Mm. Dan, you talked about this a little bit before, but when you choose to pick a cold case. I mean, I'm sure there are so many families who you, you know, receive calls from and you have to make that decision. What, what goes into that decision, if you can elaborate more on it? Uh, when they call in, when you have a family member call in, we drop what we're doing and we look at that case. Um, that's a family member that wants to know what's going on. So we'll run through the case as quickly as we can, and it's not quick, it's not fast. It takes us a while to go through a case. And uh, we, we try to determine if there is something there. And uh, uh, I had a 1980 case that a daughter called me, um, and she had stage four cancer, and she wanted something done. Sorry. She wanted something done on her mom's case. And uh, we, we managed to find the suspect and we arrested him. And uh, I got to make that phone call. Mm. So it was great. Yeah. Sergeant, what about you having, now that you have three you know, established uh, detectives on your, on your team, um, how has that been over you know, the past few years just watching your, your team grow and kind of the, the hope for, you know, families in Las Vegas? Well, obviously, it gives us a lot more uh, ability with the, the added manpower and the, and the full-time manpower uh, that we can dedicate to some of those cases. Um, we can kind of send 
uh, teams off to different places around the country if we have to and, and focus on more cases at any given time than we would have otherwise been able to uh, you know, with just our five part-timers. So it just it gives us a little more uh, ability to, to run cases concurrently. How many cases have you been able to, to solve locally? Uh, I think locally, what are we at, seven? I think we're at seven locally, um, both since we've uh, instituted the dedicated cold case squad and before. Um, like when we look at the Stephanie Isaacson case, that case was solved before Metro actually dedicated a cold case team to that. But if we look in totality, we're probably at about seven cases. So they don't, they don't work fast, you know, they're, they're not easy solves, yeah. um, especially uh, you know, if, if we have a, a suspect that is previously deceased, um, you know, we're not looking from a prosecutorial standpoint, you know, we can kind of make some of those decisions of, of considering that case solved based on DNA. Uh, but when we have a suspect that's live and that we're, we're actually looking at prosecuting, you know, we have to make, we have to decide on that differently. We have to coordinate with our district attorney's office. And there's a lot more that goes into that before we can actually make a physical arrest, actually take someone's physical liberties away uh, and put them in jail to hold them accountable for those cases beyond just the DNA evidence. Mm -hmm. You can't have just a statement from a witness. You actually have to go find that witness again mm -hmm. and then make sure that they remember what they had told us. Um, we have to corroborate everything. It's the DNA is just not, you know, it's not the, where we end. Everything has to be cooperated. So that 1980 case I was talking about, there was a lot of legwork in that before I could make an arrest. Right. So it, it was very rewarding. Yeah. When you talk about prosecuting, what does your relationship look like with the Clark County uh, District Attorney's Office? Um, I mean, Homicide as a whole has a, a very good relationship with the Major Violators Unit at the DA's office. Um, we work hand in hand with them. Uh, on all of our cases, uh, the active ones that occur from day to day, present time, but also our cold cases. And especially our cold cases, we have to sit down and, and we have to have long discussions with them and, and staff our cases with them because we just don't have the potential witnesses or maybe the evidence that is as readily available as if we were solving a case that happened yesterday. You know, we, we really have to look and see, you know, do we have the science to back it all up? We have to go out and find those witnesses that nobody may have talked to in the last 30, 40 years. And like Dan said, we have to go out, re-interview them, make sure that they remember what it is that we're told. Because at some point, if we're going to prosecute an actual person, we have to put them on the stand. Right. A another question here that I, that I wrote down and when we were talking about Othram as well was um, these private testing companies, what kind of challenges do you face with um, like access to the public database? Well, <clears throat> it's been in the news a lot about uh, should law enforcement have access to those uh, DNA databases like, you know, Family Tree, GEDmatch. Uh, so there's a lot of controversy over that. Um, I think most of that has been resolved. It, this all hit about 2018 with the Golden State Killer in California. Yeah. Um, and it was pretty divided on whether that should have been allowed or not in going in and retrieving the DNA, familial DNA, to get that case solved. But um, now I believe most of those DNA um, companies like Ancestry and Family Tree have all, they have opt in, opt out. So you can opt whether or not you want to do, you know, your DNA to be searched or not uh, by law enforcement. Um, another thing that we have to do is, um, in on most of our cases, we end up having to get a, a search warrant, you know, once we get close enough um, in order to, to be able to name a suspect. But, but so, from an author side too, the, this DNA data and the the genealogical research doesn't come from 23andMe or Ancestry. It's from like an opt-in database. So you can take your DNA profile from one of those sites or, or from other places. That's your property. People submit it to another database, which is used for like solving crimes, whether it be, you know, finding a missing child or things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's the database. The private database is the one that's been built up mm -hmm. um, to, to use and solve these crimes. Yeah. And I but, think that's, I'm sorry, I, I think that's important to note too, that we don't just use this for homicide cases. You know, we have 
Uh, and agencies all over the country have hundreds of missing person cases that are out there open and unsolved, and the same technology can be used to uh, identify human remains that have remained unidentified in the coroner's office to match those two unsolved missing person cases. So it's not even just criminal cases that we're, we're talking about. You know, we're talking about reuniting uh, the remains of people's loved ones who have just gone missing. And that's one of the things that we're doing currently with the coroner's office is trying to identify those bodies. Some of them have a murder component and then some of them don't. Um, but we would like to help that agency work through those as well to bring closure to the family that they know that that's where their son or daughter ended up, was in Las mm -hmm. Vegas somewhere. Right. Besides FGG, are there any other future advancements or technologies that the unit may be excited to explore? There's some new testing out, um, also DNA related, where uh, it's still kind of in its infancy, at least in my opinion, but rootless hairs, uh, where labs are starting to be able to take hairs that don't have their root on them at a certain length and pull enough DNA to make identifications. Um, spent shell casings is probably another one that's starting to come up, so when you fire uh, a weapon and that shell casing uh, cartridge is ejected, you know, it's been kind of burned up in the, the gunpowder in there, but uh, there's certain technology that is now being able to wash DNA off those cases uh, that we could potentially use to identify suspects in those crimes. So those are things that we're exploring right now. Um, I know our lab has, is doing a lot of research on those two different types of technologies for viability, because again, emerging technology, um, it's, it's very, very expensive. Uh, but because it's still so new, the, the chances of success also aren't super great on it. So, you know, we're talking about spending a lot of money on something that may not work really well. Right. So, but those are just, those are some other technologies that we're mm -hmm. exploring. Justin, what about uh, you and your team? What's your, your main focus right now? So, <laughs> we're expanding. People have been asking us, hey, can we do the same kind of program in different cities? We're investigating how we would be able to do that. We actually got a grant of... $494,000 recently, so wow. we'll be doing things in California and Texas to try to help. Uh, most of those are identifying um, remain, human remains, not, you know, murders. But, uh, you know, another thing that we do is on our website, for as little as $10, we crowdfund. And so when we build up enough to get another case of $5,000 of, you know, multiple people around the country, we also apply that as well, like what we call the community donations um, towards solving cases. So. Yeah. $10 can help solve a cold case. Yeah. Were you surprised when you heard about the Vegas Justice League? I was. <laughs> and I was very, I was very excited uh, because I actually, I never met Justin and Lydia um, until we went to the county commission for, um, for Stephanie Isaacson when they, when they gave them a proclamation mm -hmm. to the to the county, city, and um, they are just the kindest, kindest two people you will ever meet. And they really, they're a part of our community, and they want, um, they want to make this a better community. Um, and they're willing to come in, and work with us and work with everybody in the county to try to give closure, resolution, whatever you want to call it, and make Las Vegas a safer place to live for all of us and by um, the generosity, the way they're able to do it is through their financial generosity and, and when we meet with them, um, they're very open-minded to how we wanna do a case and um, they're, they're in on it, you know? And, and then he and Lydia come up with the uh, Vegas Justice League and we were just like, oh my gosh, this is fabulous. But, it's a dream but from our like true. relationship, we don't like we say that we're going to sponsor the cases, and they kind of say we have a case that we would like to send over to Othram. Would you guys sponsor it? We're not part of the investigation. No. We don't get like <laughs> daily reports, and we don't like. It's a great surprise for us at you know when we start one, and then maybe like a year later, all of a sudden we get to go to this like big press an announcement, and we learn all the details of you know who the suspect was, who the you know victims were. Um, all the details of the case, so it's a, it's a big surprise for us as well. Sergeant, how has it been for you to have this kind of, uh, you know, community partnership essentially with, with the Justice League? I, I mean, I don't, I don't think we could have the success that we've had without them. 
quite honestly. Uh, you know, we have to pour a lot of resources into our active homicides. Um, again, this FGG testing is very expensive, um, and it's something that has been able to allow us to develop really good leads on these old cases. And, um, you know, especially when you're talking about new technology and investing in new technology uh, with limited resources, you know, it's, it's hard for us with the limited resources that we have to say, you know, we're gonna commit $5,000 to this one case and we don't know what kind of results we're gonna get out of it. So to have uh, that benefit um, and then the continued benefit, like I said, I, I just don't think that we could have the success that we've had without them. Yeah, thank you. We do have some time for questions from anyone in the audience. Um, we're gonna pass around a mic because this is being live streamed. Just give us one moment. There's a question over here. Over here. Hi, uh, my name is uh, E.J. Davis, and I'm from New Jersey. And uh, I like the new technology that y'all have, DNA. But my one question would be, once y'all, you know, revolutionize this, are you going to use it also to get innocent people out of jail? But that's not our pur purview. We're, we're criminal defend, uh, detectives, and we go after, uh, if, if we were to find something that would indicate that somebody who's innocent, innocent, obviously would, we would release that information. Uh, the uh, Innocence Project is what you're talking about. And they're the ones that are, are working on cases. Um, but again, that's not our, that's not what we're working toward. Gotcha. We're, we're working, we're trying to get Just, DNA to right. prove guilt. Right, I understand. Um, yeah, but I'm if just we, curious if we, that, you know, yeah. would that actually be used for that purpose later on. If we came across the case and that it proves somebody's innocence, absolutely. Yeah. Right, thank um, you for your time. I so I, I was talking to Richard Branson the other day and he's very big in the Innocent Project and we would love to support him as well. So that is something that the lab could potentially do is work on the other side of that is the exonerations of people that are wrongly you know, accused or convicted. We have a few more questions. Hi. First of all, I'm going to apologize. I'm a, uh, uh, a student of the TV shows uh, Cold Case and Columbo. <laughs> and Aren't we all? Order. That's why everyone's here. <laughs> <laughs> so if I get the uh, terms wrong, I hope you'll appreciate it. First question is, you know, as Siri was saying, DNA, people could barely spell it at the time with some of those code cases that you showed up there. Mm -hmm. How is it that the evidence department or whoever can, uh, you know, contained the evidence was able to preserve the DNA over all these years so that Ultram could test it? It, you know, our, even though they didn't even know what DNA was, they did an amazing job uh, packaging evidence back then, even, even back then. You know, uh, in the 80s, it was like fingerprints and fibers and hairs, you know, when you watch those old shows that's what they were looking for but it really shows that the forward thinking of our crime scene techs and our our forensics to the way that they established protocol for the way we were going to package our evidence even back then to keep things separated and to try to protect it as best you can and on some of it uh, we get lucky i mean it's you know 40 years later and it's pristine and then on other cases you know it just the degradation was was too much and the thresholds are too low so we're not able to get them but that's what i attribute it to and, and part of that also was these crime scene analysts that are collecting the evidence were protecting themselves so they're wearing latex gloves and wearing masks to protect themselves in and they were also looking at collecting the evidence and not spoiling it at all but um they put it in there in keeping it safe. Um, there was, everybody had heard about DNA in the 80s, but nothing had occurred. Even in 1992 in the OJ case, it wasn't really believed quite yet. But everybody knew it was there. So they were looking forward to it. Okay. Um, and they were taking precautions to it. Well, Dan, here's my follow-up question for you is, 
you know, after 40 some odd years in the Isaacson case and all, if you had to take them to trial, how do you prove what they call the chain of custody for that DNA? Oh, it, it was impounded by a crane scene analyst at the direction of a detective at that time. It was impounded in a box or whatever packaging they were using at the time, using their initials and the event number of that case, and it was put into our evidence vault. And photographed. It was maimed, I'm sorry? And photographed. And photographed. And photographed at the scene, photographed in the whole process. And then it was booked into our evidence vault. And our evidence vault, it's still there. So when we decide we're going to test something, we're going back to that package. We're getting permission and opening the package and then with the, the gracious help of our DNA lab, especially Kim Murga, we open it up and test it for DNA and get a hit and then go arrest somebody. Hopefully. <laughs> Think positive. <laughs> One question for you. So is there a set of guidelines or protocol or criteria whereby you make the leap from the capabilities of Metro and CODIS into going to Orthram and genealogical DNA? Yes, actually there, there is a set of guidelines. We have to first test the DNA um, like we normally would in any sort of criminal case and get that STR profile. And then that STR4, and these are all guidelines that are uh, provided to us by the FBI. Um, when we don't get a hit in CODIS, only then are we allowed to uh, consider that sample for genetic genealogy. And then we have to do that. We actually have to get that signed off by our lab and the DA's office before we're actually able to send that out for testing. And if we get a hit, like you're talking about, in the 1980 case that I was talking about, you get a hit on a possible, I identified a suspect for the lab and the lab did a direct comparison of DNA to the, to the uh, uh, sexual assault kit that was done on the victim and it was a hit. Um, he, anyways, um, you, at, if you get the hit, at that point, we as detectives have to go out and get a confirmation hit. So we have to go back to the suspect, have a conversation with him, get another buckle swap from him to make sure it's him. And then we put it back in and it's confirmed. And at that point, um, with that, we have to corroborate everything. We have to look at it as we're going into court. So um, I had enough in that case to prove that it was him that uh, got into the house and sexually assaulted her and ultimately, ultimately killed her. So I then made the arrest. Does that make sense? Come. Okay. Right over here. I understand that you work with cases declared cold. Do you work at all with active cases? Um, right, like, now, right now we have four teams uh, that are dedicated to active cases. So we have uh, a team of six people and a sergeant that are working our active cases. And then our cold case team is dedicated to cold case and uh, other jurisdiction that require assistance. But we're, we're sitting amongst the detectives that are working active cases. And if they need, uh, if they need to talk it through or, or looking for I hate to say advice, but uh, any kind of direction, we're there. We're, I mean, we're old timers. We've been around a long time. Yeah, speak for yourself. And <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> we will help. But a cold case, what a cold case is, is the two detectives that were in charge of the case originally are no longer in homicide. So it could be last year's case that those two detectives have transferred out, retired, quit, whatever, it is now a cold case. Now, there could be a third will or fourth will, what we call a third or fourth or fifth detective going on to a crime scene um, that could take the case. But if they're swamped in a case, that will become a cold case and we will take it, even though it's one year old. And, and generally speaking, any cases over three years, even if the detectives are there, we're probably just going to take a second look at, mm -hmm. um, just to get another set of eyes on it, somebody who uh, 
can kind of give it a fresh look and see if there's anything that the original team um, either may have missed or, or just maybe didn't interpret uh, the same way. So we're continually looking at cases, um, you know, like I said, even up to like that three-year-old mark. Yeah. In 2000, when I went into homicide, it was strict that two detectives took the case and two detectives worked the case and that was it. Um, you, didn't, you didn't go, and you, you learn as time goes that the more detectives you put on it, the more eyes you have on it, the more working the street and canvassing and pulling video and all the stuff that needs to be done, the more likely you are to succeed and solve the case. So we now go with more detectives to the crime scene. I think at the minimum they send a squad to the crime scene, knowing that your likelihood of solving that case is much higher. Um, in 2002, I had the Laughlin River Run shootout where three people were killed, 17 were wounded, the Hells Angels and the Mongols had a full shootout in the casino. And uh, I took everybody that was there, including sexual assault and robbery, because we had so many people in custody. So they allow us to do those things. Very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but worth it. Yeah, Terry loves spending money. <laughs> Any other questions? Right over here, please. At what point does a case become a cold case? What, are, what qualifies that? Is it after you've gone through everything to... It, it literally comes down to the detectives. Um, and like he said, there now is, there's a time period of three years. But the detectives that have the case, if they're still in homicide, they still work the case. That's an active case. Um, if they leave homicide, it, then it becomes, uh, I, it becomes a case that we can take and, and put new eyes on. And really the term also that we look at is if there's any active leads. You know, you can have a case sitting on your desk for a year and all of a sudden get a phone call and it's no longer really a cold case. So that's why we came up with the three-year mark, just so a different detective can take a look at it, see what they think. You know, we all think, we all get to the same place different ways um, in solving these cases. I look at stuff one way, Dan looks at it another, and Matt's got a third way of looking at it. But eventually, it seems like we all narrow and get on the same page at some point. And so it's not bad after the three-year mark to have that case be looked at by different detectives. That's what, that's, you know, that's what we're thinking is, is uh, probably a good thing. If there's nothing actively going on that case, then why not let someone else take a look at it? We've never argued. We always agreed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. We'll just take one more back here. So, um, my name is Kim Erga, I, I work with Metro. Oh, <laughs> Our director. Hi, Kim. <laughs> um, I oversee the crime lab, um, as well as the fr crime scene and the evidence vault and the forensic lab. But I just want to say, I, I'm so proud to work with such an amazing group of hard workers. These folks really are the best. They work tirelessly and endlessly on cold cases and their current homicide folks. Uh, but I did just want to point to um, something Matt Downing, Sergeant Downing had touched on, which is technology. And regarding the, co the cartridge case thing, one of the things that the Forensic Lab is actively working on right now is we recently purchased with a grant and lab funds what's called a vacuum metal deposition or a VMD. I always joke that the last invention for latent prints was when they were invented in the 1800s. <laughs> um, but this technology is really going to revolutionize our lab. We just we already have the instruments in and we're currently validating them, so we hope to have this technology on in about a year or less. But essentially the premise is, is anytime you touch something, the oils and the residues from your fingerprints kind of settle and make a permanent etching. So we're hoping to utilize this technology to help visualize latent prints that have been left from folks that have loaded guns. All the criminals, please turn away. Uh, but anyways, so, it, so you leave your latent prints on these items and we're able to put them into a chamber um, wash them with different types of chemicals, and then actually visualize the folks that may have handled those items before the crime was committed. So we're hoping to have that online um, soon. Thank you. Okay, thank Yay, you. Kim. <laughs> thank you all for coming to tonight's presentation, and thank you to our panelists. Have a great night. Okay.